So before we move on to being able to combine the light of two separate telescopes, we need to look into a very specific constraint, uh, something that we've already encountered previously, uh, that we've referred to as the coherence length, which happens to be a pretty severe constraint that uh, we need to live by in interferometry. To come to that, we need to uh, admit and recognize that the emission of any natural source um, covers a very broad uh, band of uh, wavelength. Um, here I've provided you with a, uh, a very simplistic uh, description of what uh, a star, the, the emission of a star might, might be approximated by. Uh, that is simply a black body radiation curve that displays the luminosity of your star as a function of wavelength. Now we see that there's a lot of fluctuation in that, in that profile. Um, what we're going to do is focus on a very um, narrow band pass of wavelength um, defined by two cutoff wavelengths, lambda 1 and lambda 2. And uh, the, the, the band pass is short and narrow enough that we can consider that the emission of that star over this band pass is actually uniform and does not change. And if we look in detail at what the uh, emission of that object would look like in this very narrow regime, we can go as far as even imagining being able to describe the electric field that emanates from the object here, which is what we're going to do right now. So we have um, the electric field being a solution of Maxwell's equation at different wavelengths that cover the band pass we've just isolated in our previous uh, plot here. What we see on this plot is that we go from the shorter wavelength at the top to the, to the longer wavelength at the bottom, and we just have different plots for the, uh, the, uh, the different electric fields at different wavelengths. Um, what we can see is that uh, there is one point along this uh, a diagram where all of the electric fields at different wavelengths happen to be synchronized with each other and reach the, their maximum at the same time. If we collapse these uh, electric fields all together onto uh, one single plot, that, uh, that correspondence is made much more obvious. There is clearly a point in, in time and space where the electric fields are perfectly in sync with each other. And as we move away from that place or time, the, the, the fields slowly desynchronize with each other. If we, uh, here we have collapsed the five plots, but they're still uh, uh, separated. Uh, if we were to make a measurement of the electric field, we wouldn't be able to sense the individual electric field. What we would sense is the actual sum of these. And this is essentially what the sum would look like. What we see is that over a certain distance, which we call the coherence length, we have an electric field that almost behave like a perfectly sinusoidal wave uh, of um, wavelength lambda naught, lambda or lambda zero, the central wavelength of the band pass we were uh, looking into. Beyond that coherence length, uh, the um, the electric field does not uh, behave like an oscillating function anymore. We've already seen the expression for the coherence length, that's all, but it's important enough that it needs to be repeated here. The, uh, the, the, the value for the characteristic size of the packet we've just isolated earlier happens to be the value of the central wavelength squared divided by the, the band pass. And if we look at um, certain typical astronomical filters, like uh, a filter that's used to, to observe in the visible band or in the H band, each of these filters is characterized by a central wavelength. So for the V filter, it's 0 0.55 micron and a band pass of about 0 0.1 micron, a little smaller than this. And if we do the application, we see that the coherence length corresponding to such a filter is about 3.4 microns, which isn't much. 
if you do the same application in the, with the filter in the H band, so somewhere around 1.6 microns, uh, uh, which are, that filter has a slightly larger band pass, you will uh, end up with a coherence length of about 7.8 microns. What this means, again, is that over the course of the coherence length, the electric field behaves like a uh, uh, sinusoidal function. And beyond that uh, distance, it does not behave like a sinusoidal function anymore. And it uh, becomes chaotic and random and very hard to predict. What this means is that when we combine the light coming from two telescopes, in order to hope to be able to witness interferences, we need to make sure that the light coming from the two places meets in sync to within that coherence length. It's a pretty uh, stringent requirement. You have to imagine that the light coming from light years away, reaching your telescope, um, going through your interferometer, and then meeting on your science camera, that travel path has to be such that the, 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 the path um, of that light coming all the way from the star to your detector has to be equal to within the coherence length if you want to see interferences. So although the light has traveled millions of kilometers through space, it's literally in the last 10 microns that everything is going to, uh, to be, uh, th that the game is actually going to be set and it's going to decide whether you're going to see interference fringes or not. Luckily, um, we have systems that are precisely designed to guarantee that the light path is going to be um, equal no matter what the, uh, the, the location of the star in our field and that uh, system happens to be what we call an imaging system or in, or in astronomy an imaging telescope. Which is a good thing because that means that uh, any telescope can be turned into an interferometer. You simply have to put a mask in front of your telescope and the telescope does the housekeeping for you and is going to guarantee that the light is going to reach your detector or your instrument um, in sync with each other. This approach, today we call it aperture masking interferometry. But if you think about doing so with separate telescopes separated by um, very large baselines, uh, it's actually going to be a lot harder to achieve. And there's no it's no wonder that um, the first uh, actual interferometric experiment were performed uh, hundreds of years before the first uh, two separate telescope uh, um, experiment was actually done. Separate telescope is a lot harder. We'll see that.